Thank you all for coming out on this beautiful day. As uh, I think everyone has noted, there is water, water everywhere. And um, thankfully, Framingham has such good uh, public work system that the stormwater is being taken care of. Right, Fred? <laughs> um, I'm Annie Murphy. For those who don't know me, I'm the director here. Um, and I'm introducing Fred Wallace, who really needs no introduction. He has been our town historian for the past 12 years. I guess he's now our city historian. Um, and Fred has, and it, where is Ruth Ann? Ruth Ann Thomasy. They, well, Fred has done an inordinate amount of research. As he said to me the other day on this Water Water Part 1 and 2 project, he said, I think I've done enough research to get a PhD in this subject. <laughs> and he already has a PhD um, in chemistry from Tufts University. And that's about all I'll say other than Fred is available to us as town historian, as a Framingham History Center volunteer, as is Ruth Ann on Thursdays at the Old Academy in the library. We, I can't tell you how much um, he has done for us, and I'll stop right there. But anyway, um, Fred Wallace, yay! <laughs> Thank you very much, Annie. And don't go all teary on us again. <laughs> yeah, I think it's great. We, they ha we have the appropriate title for our talk today. She's already stole my line for that. Uh, but it is uh, nice to uh, see such a great crowd come out on a day like this. And uh, I want to welcome you to the second part of our program on the history of Framingham's water supply. Um, before I get started, I want to do one mea culpa, and that is to let you know that I have begged, borrowed, and stolen images for this uh, presentation from all kinds of sources. Uh, the town website, uh, the MWRA websites, the uh, Framingham History Center's archives, anywhere I could lay my hands on an image that related to this in any way. Borrowed some from Dick Paul, uh, who's in the audience, I think. I'm, yeah, I know he's in the audience, sorry. <laughs> uh, so that's my mea culpa. If I violated any copyright laws, I hope you won't turn me in. <laughs> um, we're going to resume our, ta our uh, story of Framingham's water supply today around 1940. Um, I should warn you that uh, the story gets kind of complicated, but uh, we'll begin with a quick review of what we covered in the last talk. Uh, you'll remember that much of Framingham's uh, bountiful water supply uh, resources were taken by the state legislature in the 1870s to provide Botters, uh, Boston with additional water supply. At that time, the so-called Sudbury River system consisted of three reservoirs and an aqueduct connecting them to Boston. Framingham was left with just Farm Pond as its water supply. Of course, most people in the north side of town were still living, uh, taking their water from wells and so forth. But in the south side of town, uh, they actually began laying pipe in the 1870s. And so that's when the first uh, system of water delivery uh, began in Framingham. So um, for the next hundred years, uh, the story of our water supply um, has been uh, dominated by Boston's ever-increasing need for more water. And I'll just mention some of the highlights. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to say thanks to uh, some of the people who contributed so much to this presentation. Ruth Ann Tomasini, my fellow researcher at the Framingham History Center. Without her, Without her, this talk would not have been possible. She contributed so much to it. Marcus Kemp, uh, who was the former director of the Waterworks Museum at Chestnut Hill. I hope some of you have been there. It's a fascinating place. He was uh, very helpful to me. Uh, he sat down uh, for hours and uh, talked over the history. He was a longtime employee of the MWRA before he was the director there, and I think the MDC before that. Is that right, Joe? Yes. Okay. Uh, Joe Dugan is in the, in the audience. Joe is a Framingham resident. 
and he was employed for many years by the Wellesley Water Department, is that correct? Yes. And uh, he's been a great resource to me as well. Peter Sellers, the uh, director of Framingham's Public Works, answered many questions. I'm sure he's tired of having me give him calls and bu buzz bug him with another question. I'll mention Kirsten King, Communications Director for the New England Water Works Association. Thanks to all of these people. I've already talked briefly about the Sudbury River system. You probably all recognize this site. If you drive along Route 9 westbound, you go right by it. All that dam work and so forth was built in the 1870s. I mentioned that already. Now, if we go to the 1890s, the legislature authorized the construction of another bigger reservoir. Uh, we know it as the Wachusett Reservoir and the Sudbury Reservoir, which is in Southboro. I don't know why it's called the Sudbury Reservoir, but it's in Southboro. Uh, anyways, this is the Wachusett Reservoir, and you can see Wachusett Mountain, in, or Mount Wachusett in the background there. This is the dam which uh, creates the uh, Sudbury Reservoir, and uh, you can see this if you drive out Pleasant Street, just after you go across the South Borough Line, if you look off to the right, you'll see this in the not, not very far away from the road. That was created in the uh, 18, late 1890s and early uh, 1900s. This is just a picture of some of the men, some of the workmen who uh, helped build that reservoir. As I said, this, the system was being built in the late 1890s and early 1900s, and it became operational in uh, 1905. It went through Framingham, and uh, one thing I want to emphasize about that, uh, this Western Aqueduct, of course, is part of that system. This had no provision for access by the town of Framingham. In other words, it went straight through. There was no way we could tie into that. So it was really of no use to Framingham. It was strictly benefited Boston. Um, so from 1905 on, this is a, how Boston got its water supply. It was primarily through this western aqueduct. In uh, 1912, the town of Framingham was able to establish some rights to uh, waters in this uh, Sudbury River system. I've got a little map that shows this system, and uh, I'm going to walk away from the mic here. I hope you can hear me. I'll try to speak loudly. <laughs> what you... Uh, can see here, uh, this is the route of the Sudbury River as it flows through Framingham and then uh, goes off to the northeast and through uh, Saxonville. This is the Sudbury River. And you see reservoirs that were built along that route. This is called Reservoir 1. This is Reservoir 2. And there's another uh, river that's important. It's called Stony Brook, but it was a st substantial river that came out of Southborough and ran through the western side of our town and connected with the Sudbury River here near the center. You can orient yourself a little bit here. This is Route 9 running east-west through the town. You can see the uh, center common area where we are right now here. And uh, what I, the thing I want to point out to you here is this body of water here. That's the one that you see as you drive route, out Route 9 past that dam. And we call this reservoir number three or basin number three. Sometimes it's called Foss Reservoir. So it was in 1912 that Framingham uh, uh, was able to make an agreement with, uh, with the uh, Sudbury River system people so that we could take water out of that basin. Uh, at that time in uh, 1912, um, our water was coming um, mostly from Farm Pond, but after they made this agreement with, uh, with the uh, Sudbury River system for Boston, we were able to draw water from this basin number three that you see right here. So in the years following that, um, we took less and less water out of Farm Pond and more and more water out of basin three. And in uh, 1919, uh, the town's water consumption was about 425 million gallons per year. That sounds like a lot, but today we use that much in a day. Oh, oh, almost a half, a half a billion gallons per day now. It's amazing. Uh, in 1919, Boston formed an association with, the, uh, with 19 surrounding communities uh, to cooperate on their water supplies. And uh, the so-called Metropolitan District Commission 
or MDC was formed at that time to manage uh, their water supply and sewage disposal needs. Moving on now, 1930, Framingham uh, reached an agreement with the MDC to allow us to take even greater amounts of water from basin number three, and we built a large capacity pumping station on Winter Street. Does it look familiar? Those of you who drive on Winter Street. This is the pumping station that was built in 1930. And uh, it also included chlorination facilities. I'm going to say some more about chlorination in a minute. In the 1930s, the town embarked on a search for underground water sources, feeling that uh, it was you know, getting more and more difficult to take water from Basin 3. Um, so um, we went on a search for underground water supplies and found what would prove to be one of the largest underground aquifers in the state, uh, in the northeast corner of the town off of Birch Road. I've shown this uh, before, and I'll just cover, explain a little bit again. What you have at the top here is a topographical map of the northeast corner of Framingham and some of Wayland. And you see Lake Chichewa here, Dudley Pond and Wayland, and the Sudbury River winding its way through Framingham here. Now, what I want you to do is look at this next scene and imagine that we could take a giant knife and just make a slice down through the earth and peel away the part that's in front of us to expose all the underlying layers of soil and stone and so forth that there is. <coughs> so up at, up at the top you see the, uh, the uh, soils that are right at the surface here and then we see some subsoils. Down here, the gray area is bedrock. That's, <coughs> that's the core of the planet, if you will. And uh, what you see when you make that cross section there is that right here in this area, there's a deep cut in the bedrock here. And I'm told by geologists that <coughs> this is related to the, uh, the ice ages and apparently when the glaciers of the ice ages were melting, there was a, a torrential river like nothing we've ever seen that came down out of uh, Canada and New Hampshire and cut across Massachusetts. And for hundreds of years that stream roared with water and it carved a deep cut in the bedrock. And then in the following tens of thousands of years since the last ice age, that filled up with sand and gravel and small stone and so forth and eventually water collected in there. And that is what an aquifer is. And this one here in our northeast quadrant is the biggest one in the state. Pretty amazing. So, the town went ahead and drilled into this bedrock. They started uh, uh, drilling wells in 1939. These wells are over 100 feet deep. And of course they hit a wealth of water. And uh, by 1940, these uh, wells were up and running. We were pumping water from those wells. And it was free from pollution. It did have some quality issues. There was probably a high level of iron in it, which might have given it some color. Uh, but it was basically good water. And uh, so at this point, things were looking good. Things were really looking bright for Framingham. In the early 1940s, the wells were producing 90% of our water. And uh, we were taking very little from that Basin 3, but at that time we didn't need to because these wells were meeting our needs. So we had just about achieved water independence, which is of course what we would have preferred to, to have. And uh, I should mention also that in 1930, right around this time, the town built two water towers uh, to improve the distribution system of water throughout the town. One of these was on what we call Bear Hill, that's where the university is today, and one was on Indian Head Hill. Okay, so that really sums up my uh, quick review of what we talked about in the last talk. Uh, so now we're going to do an, a little aside. We're going to talk about what was going on with Boston during those 1930s. Uh, in Boston and the MDC, the problems of water supply were continuing to grow, and in 1937, the state legislature approved plans for an even larger, even larger reservoir out beyond Worcester 
and a uh, new aqueduct called the Quabbin Reservoir and the Haltman Aqueduct. Both uh, were close to completion by 1940, and when complete, the Quabbin would be the largest man-made reservoir in the world and supposed to be able to provide water to the metropolitan area for the, quote, foreseeable future, unquote. The Holtman uh, went through Sudbury, went uh, from the Sudbury Reservoir that we talked about earlier, uh, which is in Southborough, and it went along a route which paralleled the Western Aqueduct as it passed through Framingham. Let me back up a little bit here. There was one very important difference that I want to stress uh, between the uh, Western Aqueduct and the Holtman. The Holtman had built-in access points here in Framingham. So we had the potential of using water from that source. We weren't doing it yet, but that potential was there. The uh, Holtman was made of steel reinforced concrete pipe and it was pressurized. And uh, like its predecessors, it uh, ran below the, just below the surface of the ground. And you can see it running through Framingham here. To me, its path looks uh, something like a giant earthworm burrowing its way through the town. You see this mound of earth that kind of winds its way through neighborhoods and up over hills and so forth. Uh, but in any, in any case, it was uh, intended uh, to go all the way to Boston. Remember, it was begun in 1937. Uh, but World War II got in the way, and of course, uh, things like uh, metals would, became very scarce. So work on it was suspended. Uh, uh, when it had reached uh, Weston, Massachusetts. Uh, that would be in 1941. Um, and uh, I just will mention briefly something I'm going to come back to. Uh, this, this aqueduct proved to be a very leaky system. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't seem to be... Something about the design wasn't working right. Here you can see the entire system that it, as it exists, beginning with the Quabbin Reservoir out here beyond Worcester. Uh, the blue area is the actual water, and the green is uh, protected land that surrounds it, the watershed, it's called, as it's called. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. The uh, Quabbin is connected by uh, an aqueduct <coughs> to the Wachusett Reservoir. We won't talk much about this today. Then there's another aqueduct, which it, uh, connects the Wachusett Reservoir to the Sudbury Reservoir here in Southborough. And this uh, Haltman Aqueduct that we're talking about now runs from approximately uh, Marlborough, Southborough area uh, along an eastward course <coughs> through Framingham, Wellesley, and on to, to Weston, uh, where it would eventually branch out uh, with one branch that goes to the northern suburbs and one that goes to the southern suburbs of Boston. So that tells us uh, about what was going on uh, with uh, Boston and the MDC in those 1930s. Before we go much further, there are two other uh, issues that developed in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries in connection with water supplies that we need to discuss. Uh, these two issues are disease and pollution. And you see here the Nyanza chemical plant in uh, Ashland. In the uh, 19th century, it was not uncommon for cities and towns to dump raw sewage into rivers. The simple hope, and that's all it was really, the simple hope was that uh, dilution, flow, and sunlight would have some purifying effect upon the water. The problem was that somewhere downstream there was another city or town that was drawing water from that same river for its drinking water. And as a result, there were frequent outbreaks of disease such as cholera, dysentery, typhoid fever, and the like. And it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that scientists demonstrated that the causes of such outbreaks were pathogens carried uh, by the uh, water. So a search was begun to find ways to eliminate the problem. Interesting enough, it was found that the addition of small amounts of bleach to the water and sewage eliminated these pathogens. Scientists went on to show that the active ingredient in the bleach was chlorine, and the search was on to find other and better ways to treat water. 
1908, Jersey City, New Jersey was the first city in the U.S. to introduce chlorination. And soon after, Boston began chlorinating its water. That was around 1915. Now the MDC chlorination facilities for the metropolitan area were well downstream of Framingham towards the Boston area. So any water that we were taking from Basin 3 at, the, at this time had to be treated by us, and that's why we had chlorination facilities there on Winter Street. There's also a, a natural process which has a somewhat purifying effect on water, uh, such as reservoir, which allow large, large quantities of water to sit undisturbed. Uh, and, uh, and these factors are uh, settling, if you just leave water alone, you know, if you have a water, uh, a glass of cloudy water uh, and you set it down and let it stand for a while, the, the sediment falls to the bottom. And sunlight. And sunlight has ultraviolet light, which is an antiseptic, and sunlight will kill a certain amount of bacteria that's in water. So uh, there is this natural process that does help somewhat in purifying water. Now we're going to go on now to talk about uh, pollution. Uh, in the early 20th century, uh, pollution became a major problem in water supplies that were located in or near populated areas. Industrial waste, um, as well as runoff from urban and suburban areas surrounding reservoirs, such as we had here in Framingham, created problems of pollution. Things like heavy metals, mercury, chromium, lead, and so on as well as fertilizers, detergents, auto emissions, lubricants, etc., were getting into the water supply. Just upstream of us was this notorious uh, Nyanza Chemical Company, and they had been dumping it, their wastes into the uh, Sudbury River for years, and they did use a lot of heavy metals in their processes. So uh, eventually, uh, the MDC had to stop taking water from reservoirs number one and two, if you remember that map I showed earlier. Uh, uh, res reservoirs one and two became badly contaminated, and so they just could not use the water from the, those reservoirs. Um, if you look at Quabbin Reservoir, uh, you'll see some interesting features about it, and I've got a map of it here. It's really a, a huge reservoir. It's probably 15 miles from end to end north to south, and uh, probably 10 miles wide. And the blue areas are the actual uh, areas where the water uh, is. Uh, and the surrounding dark green areas here are protected uh, lands that sur uh, surround it, the so-called watershed area. And there's no human habitation or uh, animal, uh, uh, domesticated animal uh, life allowed on, on these lands. These are uh, unspoiled forests and wetlands. So any runoff from these areas into the water of the reservoir is un uncontaminated with uh, human pollutants. And that is a, a feature uh, that, that makes that water as good as it is. So these two issues, pollution and disease, uh, would uh, present challenges to Framingham as we struggled to develop our own water supply in the 20th century. So far, uh, we've done a quick review of the early history uh, of uh, our town water supply up to 1940, and we've reviewed what was going on with Boston and the metro area up to the same time. I've got one other subject that I want to uh, review briefly, and that is sewage disposal. We talked a little bit about this in our earlier uh, lecture. So again, a quick review. If you remember, since the 1880s, the town's sewage disposal system consisted of sewage beds in Natick, near Spain Street. Wasn't that clever of us to put it in Natick? <laughs> <laughs> By the mid-1930s, however, these beds were nearing their capacity to keep up with the uh, ever-increasing sewage that was coming from the town. <coughs> Excuse me. The town made an agreement with Natick in 1937, which allowed us to hook up to their system. And their system carried their sewage, and, by, and after that, ours, uh, via a, a brook called Bannister Brook. Um, 
ultimately back into the Sudbury River. So we were still dumping sewage in the Sudbury River in the 1930s. Fortunately, we were dumping it into the river downstream of us. <laughs> By the mid-40s, the situation had reached a crisis point. There were complaints from downstream towns uh, which brought action by the State Board of Health, forcing us to stop doing this. Um, legislation was passed allowing Framingham and Natick to join the South Metropolitan Sewer Sewage District that was part of the MDC and uh, make a connection to that system. So uh, soon after that, our sewer beds in Natick were shut down <laughs> and they would become the site of the Natick Mall. So remember the next time you're in the Natick Mall you're standing on sewage beds. <laughs> From that point on we would no longer dump our sewage into uh, the river. Uh, instead it would go to Boston Harbor and beyond. Uh, we became paying uh, customers of the MDC at that point and uh, there is much more that we could say about sewage disposal, but we're going to save that for another day. Uh, and there is one related matter uh, that I would mention, um, and that is uh, something that was reaching a crisis uh, point in the 40s and 50s, and this was solid waste disposal. What do you do with all that stuff that we used to take to the dump? Um, in the late 40s, plans were made to build a large state-of-the-art incinerator here in town and uh, that was completed around 1956. Uh, the, that incinerator was up and running. And uh, at that point, uh, trash collection was begun in the town. So now let's pick up the story of our water supply during the 40s and 50s. I mentioned earlier that the town had built two water towers in 1939, one on top of the hill where the uh, university is today, and one on, the in, on Indian Head Hill. Around 1941-42, I'm not quite sure of the date, a Mr. Charles Beebe, the owner of Eastley Farm, reached an agreement with uh, the town to allow the town to construct a water storage tank on his property on top of a hill. And here, this is a Google uh, map of that area. This is Edmonds Road, probably all recognize Edmonds Road. These are the uh, Eastley Farm farm buildings here. The BB Mansion is up here on the side of the hill. And up here near the crest of the hill, there are two, now two water towers. The smaller one is the one that was built in uh, 1942, approximately. The deal was that he would allow the town to place a store, water storage tank up there. And in return, he would have free water uh, until the end of time. Uh, in, in recent days, uh, there has been uh, uh, a good deal of controversy about this agreement, and uh, we're not going to get into that today. That's a subject for other people to deal with. Um, today, there are a total of six of these water storage tanks throughout the town. These are the two that are up at the uh, BB Estate, or Eastley Farm. Uh, this is... Uh, I think the one that was on the uh, hill where the university is has been taken down. There's one down here off of Singletary Lane. There's one over by the 990 Industrial Complex. Uh, and uh, so let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five, and the sixth one on Indian Head Hill. These uh, water storage tanks have a total, of, uh, a total capacity, I think, of 900 million gallons or something like that. Anyways, a large quantity of water. After the war's end, uh, around 1948, the uh, Haltman Aqueduct, as I mentioned, it had been stopped at Weston. It was extended to Boston, and that was completed around 1948, uh, so that the Metropolitan, it was now connected with the Metropolitan Water System. One of the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, in 1951, the town's water usage hit one million gallons per year. Remember earlier it was, I've forgotten, half, half that, something like that. And the town had entered a period of very rapid growth. This shows the population 
from, uh, I don't know, 1850 to the present day. Just point a couple things out about it. You can see that the population grew at a rel relatively moderate level for almost 100 years. Then when we hit the, the baby boomer period after World War II, the, the population started to grow at a tremendously rapid rate. Um, and it almost tripled by the mid-1970s. It went from about 25,000 to uh, a little over 70,000, I believe. Uh, and of course, this presented a tremendous challenge to the town. Uh, many miles of water main and uh, hundreds of miles of sewage hookups were being done every year at this time. Now, one of the reasons that the town was able to support this rapid growth in housing throughout the community was the Haltman Aqueduct. In 1949, town meeting voted a half a million dollars to make a connection to the Haltman and build a pumping station on Edgell Road. Now, if you drive along Edgell Road, just off to the right, if you're heading northbound, you see this very utilitarian looking building here. And that is that pumping station that was built at this time. <coughs> and the Haltman runs right beside it there. That's where the yellow gate is. That's the Haltman Aqueduct. Eventually, there would be uh, four access places, access points to the Haltman within the town. This is one that's on Grove Street. And uh, you notice that uh, uh, the powers that be in the state decided to be a little more sensitive to the uh, neighborhood that they were building these things in, tried to make the pumping station look like a little house uh, <laughs> to give it a little cosmetics. Um, and right beside it here, you see the uh, chlorination facilities, because as I mentioned, at this time, any chlorination facilities were down in Weston and Norumbega in that area. So we had to do our own chlorination here. Uh, there were two more uh, access points, one on Pleasant Street and one on Elm Street. If you, if you drive up beyond the, uh, the school there on the top of the hill, off to the right, you'll see a little house that resembles this. So that was the fourth uh, access point that we had. And because we could take water from the Haltman during this time, uh, that allowed us to, to meet the, the demand that was uh, growing every day. Uh, during this 20-year period of uh, growth, the Public Works Department was in a mad race to keep up with the demands of the developers. The cost of laying water pipe lines was first borne by the town, but was soon quickly shifted to the developers. Now let me say a few words about the uh, problem of solid waste disposal that we just touched on briefly. By 1969, that incinerator that was built in 1956 had reached capacity, and the town was looking for uh, new ways to take care of its solid waste. Um, they uh, voted to, I forget the amount that was involved, but the town approved funding to replace that incinerator with a new, much bigger facility and this was up and running in 1973. You probably recognize this, it's on Mount White Road. But there were problems with this uh, operation here from the start, problems of emission. Meanwhile, just about the same time, the federal government passed something called the Clean Air Act. Whoops. The manufacturer made modifications to this new system and there was improvement, but the state EPA issued even tighter standards for air pollution at the same year. Uh, the system never achieved the desired levels of emission control. And finally, in 1987, the state ordered it to be shut down. By that time, recycling programs had begun to take hold and that revealed some of the problems, I'm sorry, that relieved some of the problems that we were having, but the town had to find other means of disposing of its solid waste. The incinerator has never been reactivated and probably never will be. Back to our history of water now. In 1962, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, was published launching a nationwide awakening to the problems of pollution and environmental issues in general. 
And the following decade was a period of uh, critical events. In uh, 1970, Framingham be began chlorination, I'm sorry, fluoridation, putting fluoride into the drinking water. We put a lot of dentists out of business, I guess. Uh, it th took a little adjusting to do. I remember, uh, I think there was some, in the early days, there was some corrosion problems with pipes, but they figured out how to control it. And, uh, so we've had fluoride in our water since 1970. <clears throat> in 1970, the wells were shut down. Because by now we were taking an awful lot of water from the Halton Aqueduct. And I think uh, it was very easy for us to become complacent and decide, well, we'll just continue to take water from the Halton. It's not that expensive and uh, these wells are a lot of trouble. So the w wells were shut down. They were restarted in 1971. And uh, I've tried to pin down exactly what happened in the next 10 years, talking with Peter Sellers Nobody seems to have a clear picture of just why, but the wells were never really brought back up to full operation. And I think eventually it was decided that it's so easy to get water from the Holtman, we'll shut these down, just keep them for standby in case there's an emergency, there's a catastrophic failure of the system or something. <coughs> and so uh, that's the story on the wells. And in 1972, Congress created the uh, Clean Water Act, which of course impacted drinking water, sewage, and those things. Um, and uh, it also created the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. In 1973, the town built a fifth uh, water storage tower out near the 990 Industrial Park. And on, also, during this period in the 1970s, um, nationwide attention was focused on Boston Harbor. It was uh, called the most polluted body of water in the USA. And of course, Bostonians took this right in stride. You remember the song, which you often hear at Red Sox games now? Love that dirty water, Boston, you're my home. So that's been immortalized by the Red Sox now. <laughs> uh, in response to uh, pressures from the EPA, the Massachusetts legislature, uh, then uh, passed legislation creating the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, or the MWRA, to provide water and sewer services to three million people in 51 municipalities around Boston, including Framingham. I'm not gonna try to get into the detail of this. It just shows the area that's covered by the MWRA very quickly. Boston is right in the heart of it here. And uh, all of these communities which are inside of Route 128 are included. And also communities that border Route 128 uh, but are just outside of it like Wellesley, Weston, and so on. And then a series of towns going west, uh, Wellesley, Natick, Framingham, Southborough, and uh, they are all towns which are on the route of the Haltman Aqueduct. Not all of them are taking water from the Holtman, but they're all along the route. So in 1985, Framingham uh, set rates for water and sewer based on MWRA requirements, and these were fairly reasonable at the time. Then the Boston Harbor Cleanup Prog Program began, and it was funded exclusively by the MWRA. I don't know, there might have been some federal funds, but basically the, the rate payers within the MWRA are the ones who bore the burden for that. And all the cities and towns served by MWRA began feeling the pain of steadily increasing rates. This uh, shows that second water tank that was constructed up on the BB property in 1985. It's a one million gallon tank. So we'll talk about the period 1985 to 1995. This was a period of steadily increasing regulations and requirements for water and sewer. The standards for drinking water became more stringent. Recycling became a major factor in solid waste management. The limitations on emissions became tighter and all of these factors impacted the cost of providing good drinking water and managing sewage and water, uh, solid waste. 
the MWRA water and sewer rates continued to rise. In 1987, as I mentioned, the Massachusetts EPA ordered Framingham to shut down its incinerator. And uh, during this period, the um, MWRA recognized that it would need more water, and plans were developed for, uh, for a new aqueduct to, to be known as the Metro West Water Supply Tunnel. Now there was plenty of water in the Quabbin and in the Wachusett reservoirs. It was just a problem of the delivery system. By now the Hultman Aqueduct had been in service for almost 50 years and it was showing its age. There was plenty of water in the reservoirs as I mentioned, but there were problems with the delivery system. The leakage problems with the Hultman Aqueduct, which I referred to earlier, had gotten much worse. It was estimated that on average over almost a half a million gallons of water was being lost every day from the Houghton. The population of the metropolitan area, meanwhile, had continued to grow, increasing de its demands for water needs. And yet the Houghton was virtually the, their only source and had become Framingham's only source as well. A major breakdown in that system would be catastrophic and uh, state authorities recognized the danger and began to make plans to develop a new, bigger aqueduct, and as I mentioned, to be known as the Metro West Water Supply Tunnel. Now, in the early 90s, the MWRA established working groups in towns along its route to advise and participate in the planning and preparation of, uh, for what would be impacting neighborhoods along the route. Things such as uh, truck traffic, um, removal of material from the digging, possible damage to buildings and so on uh, from underground blasting would, that would be necessary. And of course, Framingham's uh, water department would be represented in, in these uh, working groups. Uh, we have a person in the audience today, Dick Paul, a friend of mine, uh, who was a member of that working group for Framingham. Dick, where are you? Raise your hand. Do you want to say anything about your experience with the water supply tunnel? No, <laughs> Okay. Uh, he's very shy. Not really. Um, the tunnel was to be uh, approximately 15 feet in diameter and dug at a depth between 205 feet to 500 feet below the surface. 200 to 500 feet below the surface. I understand that most of it was at a depth of about 400 feet. Is that right, Dick? Yeah, 400 plus or minus. So construction was begun in 1993. Again, we got, just imagine that we took a giant knife and cut down through the soil so that we could expose the water supply tunnel. It started out here in uh, uh, Marlboro, Southboro area. It was a shaft that went down, and then it ran west to east over 17 miles. And, the, and another important feature of this, again, was that there were access points along the way. There were, there were uh, vertical shafts dug down to meet the tunnel and for workmen to get in and out of it so that it could be serviced and constructed and so forth. And you see that it, uh, it went through Southboro, Framingham, Wellesley, uh, Wayland, Wellesley, and so on. And uh, Framingham was very fortunate to have one, two, three, four, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four shafts uh, that, that went down to the tunnel itself. So those are access points to that water. So we had four access points within Framingham. And uh, at the surface, uh, we could bring water up uh, parallel to those shafts and make a connection over to the Hultman Aqueduct. So this was very key because it meant that uh, once those two systems were operating, there would be a redundancy in the system and should one of them fail catastrophically, the other one would still be available for use to supply Boston and the metro area. Here are some, uh, some of the workmen down in the uh, bottom of the uh, shaft I think it's in the Marlboro area, or maybe Dick, do you know where that is? No. 
Okay. Um, are you in the picture here somewhere? No. Okay. I was watching them. Well, let's go on to this picture. Here you are, Dick, right over here. Uh, does anybody recognize this fellow? John Stasek. And uh, I'm sure there are other fellows that some of you may recognize who were in that working group at the time. But they're down 400 feet underground and they're still smiling. I don't understand why. I'd be scared out of my tree. Of course, once they had the tunnel dug, they had to build, uh, they had to pour concrete to create a pipe down at that depth. And uh, so they built forms for the concrete to go into. This just shows some of those forms. This is down at the bottom of one of those vertical shafts. And it shows how, they, uh, how you could see the pipe running through and the connection to the other uh, water system. And this is just another one of those connecting points um, between the Haltman and the Metro West water supply tunnel. So this thing was a really amazing uh, feat of construction. I'll share one little anecdote uh, that I learned about regarding the uh, possible damages that could be related to building this thing. It seems that there was a homeowner uh, on Brook Street who had a little pond in his backyard. Um, and one morning he got up and looked out the back window and the pond was dry. Well, what had happened was that the blasting three or four hundred feet down below had cracked the bedrock and the water from the pond simply drained down and <laughs> left him with a dry pond. And there's another story about Dudley Pond over in Wayland that Dick has told me about. And I think we just about, the same thing happened over there and just about almost drained Dudley Pond dry back in 19, probably 1998, 2000, right around that period there. So there were things that happened uh, during the construction of this thing which were quite a surprise to everybody. If I could just comment. Sure. What we did in Dudley Pond is take water out of the aqueduct and put it back in. And they also had to build a, an untreatment plant because the water in the aqueduct was treated and I had to purify it to put it back into Dudley Pond. <laughs> Amazing. I'm sure that asked, added hundreds of millions of dollars to the cost of the project. Anyway, uh, as I mentioned, that part of the plans uh, that were uh, created back in the late 1990s uh, was to uh, build a new, up to uh, state of the art water treatment plant to provide clean water for this Metro West water supply tunnel. And that plant, uh, they broke ground for that plant in 2000. This is in Marlboro, and it's known as the John J. Carroll Water Treatment Plant. And uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, state-of-the-art facility. I mean, the, the technology that's in this thing is amazing. Just one, one small part of it. Um, one of the treatments they, that they do is ultraviolet light. I mentioned that sunlight has a purifying effect on water. Well, you can create ultraviolet light in an artificial environment, and this is very intense ultraviolet light. And uh, if, if you can picture, there is water streaming through these great big pipes here, and there's several different stations, and at each one, the water is being blasted with ultraviolet light, and that is killing bacteria and that sort of thing that's in the water. This chart here shows uh, what is going on in the water treatment plant. The, prim the primary treatments, one that I've just mentioned already here, is ultra ultraviolet light, which has a disinfectant effect on the water. Uh, the other is ozone. In the past, it was chlorine that did the, the uh, uh, effect on water. Today, we use ozone. And the beauty of ozone is that after it's done its work, there's nothing left over but oxygen. So there is no pollution. And nothing is being added to the water other than a good thing, oxygen. So ozone and ultraviolet light, those are the primary treatments. Uh, we, there's a little bit of a fluoride added to the water. There's a little bit of chloride in the form of hypochlorite. Um, and then there are th some things that are added to adjust the pH of the water so that it doesn't corrode your pipes. So the water that's coming out of that plant is amazing. It's uh, incredibly clean. Now, in 2003, the Framingham Water Department 
realizing that uh, you know these rates that we were paying were really getting out of control, realizing that large savings uh, might be possible if we could restart the wells, began to explore the possibility of doing that. So they uh, worked on that for several years and came up with a, a final report and recommendation that we start up the wells, which was submitted to the state in uh, 2009. The uh, results of that study were that uh, the wells could be restarted and they could provide a significant portion of our water. Reports were filed with the state and a year later the State Environmental Protection Agency ruled that the study was uh, incomplete, of course, <coughs> and the plans were insufficient. Uh, nobody was surprised at that, I don't think. A year, uh, the town then enlisted the aid of the United States Geological Survey to do a more in-depth study of the issue, and they issued a report in 2015 that showed that up to three million gallons per day, or roughly one half of our daily water supply, could be pumped from the aquifer without having any adverse effect on things like the levels of water in the Sudbury River or in Lake Kachichuit. Meanwhile, by uh, 2010, the Metro West Tunnel had been up and running for a few years, and the um, um, MWRA undertook a complete overhaul of the Haltman Aqueduct to repair and upgrade it to modern standards. That project was completed in 2014. We're now coming to the conclusion of our story. In 2014, the uh, Framingham Town Selectmen signed a 10-year contract to continue buying water from the MWRA with a provision that if we were able to reactivate the wells, that uh, we would be allowed to reduce our purchases from MWRA. However, other stakeholders in this whole issue, uh, namely the town of Wayland, the National Wildlife Federation, national parks, public environmental groups, and so on, continued to object to the plan. So the matter of restarting the wells remains unresolved at this time. I'll end by highlighting two reports. We all received a little report from the MWRA in 2015 telling us about the uh, quality of our water. And I don't expect you to be able to read this whole chart. I just want to point out a couple things. These are some of the pollutants or uh, chemicals that we don't want to have in our water. And uh, these are the allowable limits in parts per million for the most part. And we can uh, just ignore these numbers here. What I want to bring your attention to is the violation column. And you can see it's all nose. So we are in compliance with every one of these uh, concerns about uh, drinking water quality. Um, so we can be quite proud of that. And I'll end up by talking about the major responsibilities of our water department to provide excellent quality water to uh, approximately 75,000 people in the community through a system of four pumping stations, 250 miles of pipe and a thousand valves, thousands of valves to maintain a system of six water storage tanks uh, with a total capacity of nine million gallons to provide fire protection through a system of approximately 2,000 hydrants and to maintain hookups and meters to 17,000 residences and commercial properties throughout the community. In uh, 2017, Blake Lucas, who is the head of our water department, in 2017, he and his people achieved a prestigious award from the New England Water Works Association, the Utility of the Year Award for municipalities of 50,000 or greater people. Congratulations to them. Um, we are very lucky to have some of the best water, quality water in the country. And if you have any doubt about that, go, go to uh, South, Southern California and find out what they do with drinking water there. I mean, it's like, it's precious. People only use a cup of water to brush their teeth. They're so concerned about water consumption. We are very lucky. We have some of the best water in the country, maybe some of the best water in the world. 
uh, and I wish Blake were here today that was so that we could congratulate him. And I want to mention that on the town website, the Water Department has a wonderful website where there's all kinds of information, a lot of it included in this program today. And, uh, and uh, I would recommend that you go to that. Just log on to the town website, uh, click on Departments, then click on Department of Public Works, and then find Water Department. And it's all right there for you. You can learn much more about our water. So that's really all I have to say. I think I stayed within an hour or almost. I uh, hope I didn't uh, wear anybody out, and I'd be happy to uh, take a few questions. We're all drinking out of those. It's pumped from, from the Haltman up to the water tanks, and then it's distributed from the water tanks throughout the community. Yep. It's so deep. Why does it have to have a hump over it? The, the, the Haltman. Oh, it does not have. You will not see any evidence of. Well, the Haltman it runs. The Haltman runs along the surface. It's the Metro West water supply tunnel that's two, three, four hundred deep. You don't, you don't see anything along the way. An occasional hard to recognize uh, a little shack that represents where the shaft is that goes down. Yep. Oh, Haltman was one of the engineers that uh, worked on the project. It's the same with all of these, like the reservoirs, the uh, Foss Reservoir, the Brackett Reservoir, the Stearns Reservoir. These things are all named after engineers that worked on these projects. Yes? On the Metro West uh, section you showed, the part on the left said West Heading, and the part on the east said East Heading. Does this thing slope to the middle? Is that what I was seeing, or does that mean something totally different? Can anybody help me with the answer to that one? Joe in the back here. Head in other words, uh, what your head pressure what your reservoir, your source water reservoir, that's the hydraulic gradient. So therefore, if the bottom pipe slopes other ways, it's not a problem. Uh, so it's viewing where the hydraulic gradient starts and ends. Thank you. Under construction, you have to deal with Dudley Pond, that the drain into it. There's indices in the rock that are going to drain into the tunnel and have to get it out. But once it's online, it's the hydraulic gradient established by your source. Now you see Joe is using terms like hydraulic gradient. What I discovered in, in researching this is that uh, there's a whole science and technology around water handling, how you, how, how you store, how you move uh, water, and uh, pressures and it's really a complicated, it's a real science and technology unto itself and I am not <laughs> well schooled in it. Yes, Dick. Uh, I want to see if I can answer part of this question. When you looked at the aqueduct, you saw that the new one is sloped down and that to the low point was right up there at New England Sandy Gravel because as they were boring through the bedrock, there was, there was infiltration of water and muck. And they had to pump the water out as fast as it came in or else it would just flood. Yeah, see, until they got the pipe, the concrete pipe built and sealed, it was porous and water was constantly, by gravity, is constantly finding its way down into the tunnel. They, they calculated that they were going to have 300, uh, 3 million gallons a day water infiltration. <clears throat> And that was all pumped up in Saxonville. It was retreated. They had sediment tanks and ultraviolet lights, and it flowed into the Sudbury River. They were really concerned because one time they got up to 200 and uh, um, almost 3 million. And they had to build another treatment plant <laughs> because they were afraid they wouldn't have the capacity to do it. As it turned out, they didn't need it. The calculations are right on. Any other questions in the back row? When you did Dudley Pond, you untreated the water? Yes. Yeah. Did you treat the water? 
happened was because of the water flowing through the bedrock, the, the, the water level in Dudley Pond went down, and people got up one morning and their docks were <laughs> out of the water. So to fix it, what the MWRA did was, fortunately, there was a riser shaft in, in Wayland from the, and so they had access to water from Holton. So they built a pipeline, they had to build a new treatment plant to untreat the water before they put it back in Dudley Pond. They put chlorine in That's correct. Yeah. Or whatever else they had in yeah. chlorine. And didn't it keep leaking out of Dudley Pond again? What point does this they, cycle stop? As they bored the tunnel, they had to go and fill the cracks with, I believe it's called hydraulic cement. And so they were always caulking. It's like caulking. And they were always caulking in the tunnel. And just to add one more question, just a comment. Uh, I read those sewer heads on uh, each side of Route 9. When they closed them, you could buy that land for like five bucks an acre. <laughs> <laughs> made you very rich today. <laughs> That's right. Sure, right. Uh, the cameraman has a question. How much lower would our water rates be if we could use the per 12? 10%? 40%? I wouldn't have to guess, but it would be considerably lower. Probably closer to 10 to 20 to 30% lower, something like that. Yeah. And when, another question, somebody had a question. Yeah, I had a question as to whether the old aqueduct, the Halton aqueduct, used well, siphons to bring water from what you Yeah, there are siphons, and it is pressurized. It is pressurized. Uh, that's the difference between that and the earlier uh, aqueducts. So that was a very pressurized aqueduct. Yeah. Just wondering, what's the life expectancy of the tunnel? All these things have a life expectancy, right? Uh, would you think? Uh, usually, usually these things, uh, after about 50 years, you need some serious repairs. I mean, well, it's been a lot of good questions. Uh, well, thank you again.